So to start off, what, what are coral diseases? Well, uh, strictly they're not really diseases at all, they're, they're syndromes, uh, because if it was a disease we would know what the uh, causal agent is. Um, and like I say, although there's about, uh, the last count was about 21 different types of diseases, uh, officially we only know the causal agents of five, um, and out of those five, all of them are disputed uh, via different uh, researchers. So that brings us down to us actually knowing nothing about coral diseases uh, in total. Um, but the broad definition of a disease is any perturbation uh, from a healthy state that impairs the function of an organism. So if you take that into account, uh, then we can class bleaching as disease because it is uh, a, a change or cause of effect uh, from the norm. So if we look at def uh, a broader definition of disease, we can actually uh, categorize a disease into a variety of different uh, areas. Uh, we can look at um, if it's healthy, it's in a nice area of homeostasis, everything's working as it should do. Um, then you start getting stressed and we're moving into a compensation section. Uh, so the, the organism's trying to compensate for this stress, this increase in, in uh, added pressure, uh, then it moves into diseases, and diseases can be separated into curable diseases and incurable diseases. Uh, curable are obviously reversible, uh, incurable are irreversible. Sounds simple. Irreversible usually leads to death. Poor corals. Um, currently, uh, most coral disease uh, does lead to death for the corals. Uh, it is transferable, uh, and because these uh, corals usually live in large colonies, um, it spreads quite quickly uh, and efficiently and can kill huge tracts of reef uh, relatively efficiently. Uh, so what are the trends? Well, are we actually seeing more coral diseases or are more people looking for coral diseases? That's something I can't actually answer, uh, but if you look at this, it shows that uh, the increase in publications uh, is uh, dramatic, uh, but most people started looking after the 98 bleaching. So before that, we didn't really understand anything about it. So all that death was associated uh, with bleaching of coral diseases, uh, bleaching of corals, um, but the likelihood is uh, there was actually a, a huge impact of disease which followed the bleaching. Uh, but we just didn't, weren't looking for it at the time and we don't understand. So we can't really go back in time, unfortunately. Uh, but what we are starting to notice as bleaching events increase, like in 2010, uh, that diseases were coming in after the corals started to recover a little bit, but were still in their stressed state. Uh, so I said we'd look at what, ye what causes yellow band disease. Uh, this is mostly in the Caribbean, you'll see this. Um, so you, you shouldn't, hopefully, uh, see yellow band disease on your corals. If you do, give me a shout straight away. Um, and I'll run over here, or fly, as the case may be. Um, but if you look at uh, Montastria in the Caribbean, you see uh, quite a lot of yellow band disease. It's one of the most uh, dominating diseases in the Caribbean at the moment because Montastria is one of the most dominating corals in the Caribbean, or the, the, the species which are involved with that genus. Um, and what you find, and this is in collaboration with lots of other uh, researchers as well, you find this uh, big increase um, in one particular genus uh, of bacteria called Vibrios. It's a very famous genus. Uh, it's thought to cause a lot of different diseases going from uh, fish to whales. Um, and it's been uh, thrown around the coral world for a good few years uh, that things like uh, Vibrio corolliticus and Vibrio harvii uh, were thought to be causal agents of other diseases as well. This is starting to come uh, a little bit into question now and that uh, Vibrios are not the sole causal agents of many different coral diseases, uh, but we believe they're definitely involved in yellow band disease. Uh, another disease, which I, I didn't show you a picture, again, a uh, very imaginative name, this is dark spot disease, um, and causes uh, a, a lot of uh, concern again, and, and concerns starting to rise uh, on Stephanosenia um, interceptor, another very dominant species of coral in the Caribbean, um, and it's starting to wipe out that. So the Caribbean is uh, in a bit of a bad state, unfortunately. Uh, they lost most of their acroporids. They only had two species of acropora, whilst you have a lot uh, of a more diverse community. Um, and they lost those two, uh, mostly down to uh, white band disease, which wiped them out um, quite early on. And uh, now Montastria is being wiped out, um, and then Stephanosenia. Uh, so Caribbean is struggling. 
Well, the Indo, Indo Pacific, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, uh, all throughout uh, Australia and the, uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, Indonesia, uh, you guys have a, a huge diversity of corals. Um, and in certain areas, diseases uh, are, are not as uh, important players. Uh, but there are, you will always find them on every reef you look at, uh, which is still a cause for concern. As far as dark spot is concerned, we started looking uh, into other microorganisms. Um, and in this instance, it was a fungi uh, called Rytisma. So uh, we moved away from looking for bacterial pathogens, and we start assessing other microorganisms and their role on coral reefs. And currently, fungi is uh, very uh, little understood um, in the marine environment. Uh, you could go outside, you could pick up anything like a sponge, uh, you could assess the diversity of the fungi, and I can guarantee you'll find 10 to 15 new species of fungi known to science. Um, and this is something we're starting to look at now. Um, and it's a very good thing if, if uh, there's any uh, medical uh, students out there uh, looking into bioremediation, looking into drug discovery, uh, use the marine environment to find out uh, all these new species which have these antimicrobial capabilities. Um, and that's starting to get the attention of, of both funders and researchers. Interestingly, uh, this particular uh, fungal species, or the, this genus, Rytisma, um, was also shown to cause a, a similar disease, in my opinion, um, to that of uh, a terrestrial disease, a plant disease uh, called uh, tar spot. Uh, usually in, in sycamores, it's a, it's a very common disease in, in Europe. Uh, but it's also all around uh, America and South America. And it works on exactly the same way, where in, in the plant side, Sounds like the world's ending outside. Um, with the plants, the, the, the fungus actually attacks the, the chloroplasts, very similar to the zooxanthellae of, uh, of the corals. And it causes this dark and pigmentation. Um, it doesn't actually kill off uh, the leaf properly, uh, but it affects its uh, uh, capabilities of survival. Um, and the fungus is actually quite clever on the terrestrial side uh, because it will uh, cause the, the tree uh, to drop its leaves quicker um, and then the fungus carries on its life cycle because it survives over winter um, under um, a, a thick leaf litter. And it's starting to show that there might be strong links between the terrestrial environment and the marine environment as far as diseases are concerned. And it's a new type of research which uh, hopefully other people will be encouraged uh, to look into and something we're finding quite a lot. To back this up, uh, we just started looking at a, a sponge disease occurring uh, throughout the Maldives, uh, which is quite common on this blue uh, sponge species. We're still to identify what the actual uh, species is. Um, sponges are notoriously difficult to actually get down to species level, uh, and the only way you can do it is look at spicules inside the sponge uh, to tell the difference between them. However, we found uh, this disease which is uh, quite prevalent, uh, usually around this time of the year. Um, it seems to die off again um, during uh, the latter end, so going from August uh, to kind of November time, you don't really see it, uh, but it seems to flare up now. Um, and it's caused by a, another uh, fungus called Rhabdocline, um, and you can see the fungus hyphae uh, spreading throughout the sponge tissue here. Similar to what we found with the, the coral disease over in the Caribbean, uh, it's another plant pathogen. So this is called, uh, caused on carnivorous uh, needle uh, furs, um, and you can see, in my opinion, something quite similar uh, to the brown patterning occurring down here uh, to what's happening on the, the trees' leaves as well. Might just be me uh, hypothesizing too much, I think too much whilst I'm uh, wandering around, but it gives you a, to me that looks quite similar. You have to kind of squint a little bit um, and have a, a good imagination. Uh, but. Anyway, I, I think there's some important aspects to look into this uh, cross between terrestrial pathogens um, and those which are occurring in the marine environment. But let's focus on white band disease. Uh, we're going to look at two different scenarios, two, uh, two lots which fit into the, the overall group of white syndrome, uh, white band disease in the Caribbean and then white syndrome in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so why do we look at white band disease? Well, it was a major uh, cause of the collapse of the acroporids, um, which, uh, as you can see, this is what you should be seeing over there. This is uh, Acropora palmata. Um, and then when you go out in the reef, uh, this is the, the likely uh, view you see. 
I say that, I took them both at the same time right next to each other, but um, that's just a bit of trickery. Uh, so you can actually still see some uh, nice reefs out there in the Caribbean, but they're few and far between, um, and most of them are dying. But you can actually see some new recruits occurring. Uh, there's one, I don't think the mouse is working, but on the left-hand side, second from the top, uh, you can see a little baby recruit, uh, which has recolonized uh, the dead parental uh, colony. So what we look at, this is a, we'll use this as a, an example of what you start looking at as far as microbes are concerned. Um, but what you, you first need to do is understand uh, what's happening in a healthy organism. So this is all the different uh, bacteria associated with healthy corals. So it shows that corals are harbor this huge diversity uh, of microorganisms. It varies in the different uh, groups associated, uh, but one of the most common um, in, uh, in this particular species uh, is Epsilon proteobacteria. Proteobacteria are one of the most dominant groups throughout the marine environment. Um, but there's a whole different suite of alpha proteobacteria, gamma, beta, green sulfur bacteria, cytinobacteria, uh, firmicutes, uh, cyanobacteria, you name it, corals have it. Um, but what we're interested in uh, is the actual diversity associated with it. The next step is to look at what happens in a diseased individual. And we want to compare uh, the difference between healthy and diseased uh, individuals. So you need a, a good enough replication. This is just free in, in this case, just for ease of explanation. Uh, however, we usually do it with about six or more, uh, depending on the, the strategy and the sample design and the amount of time we've got. Um, but if you do this, what you're looking for is something absent um, in the healthy, absent or rare, uh, but more importantly, absent. Um, and something dominant and present in the disease samples. And this is indicative of a potential pathogen. This is where we're starting to look for what actually causes that disease. So if you do that, you end up with these 13 different candidates. You see there's a cheeky Vibrio sneaking in there. Um, and there's a few other potential uh, causal agents. Uh, lactobacillus is another uh, known uh, pathogen associated with uh, different diseases around the world. So we're starting to get a bit of an idea, but uh, that doesn't give us the whole story. Um, also, this is a, a time-lapse imagery. This is one frame taken every three minutes and then sped up. Um, and what you can see here, hopefully, if the lights are okay for you, um, you can see lots of things eating uh, the coral tissue, and they're starting to move the tissue down. It's quite slow, but I'll show you another video later on in the Indo-Pacific, which shows you that it moves at a faster rate of similar disease. Uh, but these things are called ciliates. These are protozoans. Uh, and we found this out uh, first time in Australia. Um, and it made us look at these other type of microorganisms and the importance they have as far as reef health is concerned. Uh, and we started to look all around the world. And we noticed that all coral diseases have uh, some association uh, with these ciliates. Um, as you can see here, there's absolutely nothing in a healthy coral. The chances are they probably just eat them. It's probably a natural food source for when a coral's in a, in a good condition and very healthy. Uh, but you get quite a large diversity um, associated uh, in, the, in the disease colonies. So we know what's present in healthy um, and disease. The second step when you're looking at trying to find a pathogen uh, or a specific single pathogen or a, a group or what's called a consortium is you want to find them inside the tissues themselves. And like I said right in the, in the introduction, this is a bit of a problem. We've always found aggregations of this particular uh, species of uh, bacteria endosychomonas, but we've never found uh, the mass increase of bacterial load you expect to see uh, as far as when you count the number of bacteria in bleach samples and disease samples. Um, this is a, a, a good example. Uh, it looks like a blank screen to you with a couple of white spots. Um, but what you should see, hopefully, is a few red spots up there. Uh, that's the autofluorescence of the coral. That's the, uh, up at the top, uh, you've got the symbiotic algae. Down at the bottom, you've got the mucocytes, which uh, autofluoresce. Um, but what you should see on the right-hand side, um, or left-hand side, right for you. Um, you should see it lighting up like a Christmas tree, like that hydra I showed you right at the beginning. Um, but we never see that with a coral. We never see this increase in bacterial diversity. Uh, so that's quite strange. We, we can detect it molecularly, uh, but we can't find it within the tissues. 
However, if you do, it's exactly the same sections. Uh, hopefully, some of you will be able to see that uh, there's a dip in that left-hand side. And then if we uh, use a, a different staining method, uh, you can actually see the tissue a little bit clearer in here. The blue is the autofluorescence in this case. Uh, we send a UV light down. Uh, but we've stained this with a particular uh, histological stain which, causes, uh, which shows necrosis. So in the healthy sample, this is the healthy sample uh, on this side, uh, you see that there's no uh, major brown staining occurring. Whilst on this side, uh, you can see that the symbiotic, symbiotic algae and also the epithelial tissue on this side uh, is starting to be fragmented uh, and show, staining up brown. And that's showing that there's an increase in necrosis. Um, and although we haven't been able to find the bacteria specifically, uh, what we found uh, using another technique which we're going to look into is that it's got to be bacterially induced. Um, so we know that something's happening inside the coral in advance of this disease lesion, uh, which is causing uh, mass necrosis uh, and obviously starting to kill off the coral. Uh, 